Um, Candy is soft-spoken, she's lovely, she's humble, and I doubt she ever would have asked for herself. So yay, Laura. <laughs> she's got a master's degree in English Lit, continuing stu continued her study at UCLA and Oxford, teaching creative writing and memoir at community colleges and in her home for years. She comes to us today to read from her young adult novel. Uh, no? Well, this is Olivia Slept. It's not the young adult. Th this the slip show is done. Okay, you've seen the end of it now. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, okay, Olivia Slept, and I'll let Candy give you the background on that. Um, but I wanted to share with you a quote from her bio. I subscribe to the theory that we write to discover what we know. And what I know best is what I cannot change. What holds me back without acknowledging what that barrier is, is that I can't wait. Stop. I subscribe to the theory that what we write to discover what we know, that we write to discover what we know, and what I know best is that I cannot change what holds me back without acknowledging what that barrier is. For me, that has meant dissecting the most difficult events in my personal timeline and writing at them from all necessary angles until they make a kind of sense to me. And that made a lot of sense to me. Please help me welcome Candy Simone. <laughs> oh my God. You're wired. I thought you wanted to touch my breasts. <laughs> I'm very proud of them. <laughs> Remember me, I'm soft-spoken. Um, <laughs> the other side. I'm, I'm going to read something that's kind of like um, the dark side of the carpool. Uh, <laughs> as if that weren't the dark side. <laughs> you know. uh, and this story is, is the story of a woman whose who's, uh, child has died, um, who has failed at suicide, who's divorced, who's been institutionalized. And she has to discover why all of this happens to her and, and why it feels familiar um, and constant. So I'm, I'm reading a part of the first chapter. Um, she's about to, to um, leave the institution, and she's kind of reflecting on what it was that got her there. It's from Olivia Slept. Dr. Chang in the hospital had taken away my opportunities. But for all of those early weeks, I was merely biding my time, waiting to find my chance. I felt only numb. The pain had ripped at me until I could understand what it was telling me. Then the razor sliced, when the razor sliced into my skin, I felt relief, immediate, overwhelming relief as though demons had been trapped just beneath the skin of my inner wrists, clawing their way out of my veins, and I had only opened the door that released them all. The pulsing of the beautiful red blood lightened me, drained the nightmares from my mind. To make those cuts was the single most perfect choice I had made up to that moment in my life. I can't imagine that anything else I do for the rest of the time I have left will be as absolutely right. But of course I didn't die and the demons came back and now I understand that I am not waiting to be out from under the kindly scrutiny of Dr. Chang, nor away from the disapproving cruelty of Rhonda so that I may take my life and give it as penance for Tara's. I see now how selfish it would be to take that step. The one perfect moment when my motives were pure, when I would have died of love and grief, has passed, and I am left with only the desire to replicate the removal of pain. I crave the moment the pain ceases. At first there were drugs here at the hospital, but they didn't so much take away the pain as they took away time. I felt the pain, then I felt the pain with a renewed intensity. What I tried to tell Dr. Chang was that there was no relief all conscious thought was pain. He says the drugs gave me rest, that my body gained precious time to heal and repair the physical debilitation. But I can't make him understand that I know, even in the blackness, the nothingness of those states, I know the pain was feeding on itself, growing stronger, taking over more of what was me, so that when the darkness became light and I knew myself again, I could tell the pain had gained strength and I had weakened. Eventually, I learned to stop fighting everything, even the drugs. I retreated again, back into the smallest room in my head, the one where I could be alone with Tara and nothing else infected our world. Not time, not drugs or shock treatments, not Dr. Chang's concern, and certainly not Rhonda's cruelty. Tara and I, alone in my mind, 
She laughed and cried and died over and over again just for me, and I still could only watch her. Not once in those weeks did I reach out and save her, not one single time. Each time she died, I saw everything that happened to her, but never once did I even cry, stop, or no. I let her drown hundreds, thousands of times. I'm not certain what I looked like to the world during those days, but I became conscious of the world intruding into the room with Tara and me. At first I saw shades like puppets behind a thick screen, muffled voices, just noises really, called into the screams of my daughter as she caught herself falling into the pool. There was not enough sound to distract me, but I gradually became aware. The day came when I felt a touch, but I can't remember when that day was. The touch was on my cheek. It felt like a live electrical wire had blown onto my skin. Sometimes even now I think that I can feel it, and I still look for signs that perhaps Perhaps Rhonda had actually shocked my cheek when no one else was looking. But that wasn't the truth. It was only a hand, a caress, really. I know because I felt it again after that first time. The odyssey of my stay at the hospital is not one I can fully recount. I guess I should be suspect of my version of the original experience, knowing what I know about forgetting. But Dr. Chang, my bellwether, Dr. Chang and his all-seeing eyes, tells me that I am now strong enough to live outside the walls. Sometimes I wonder, but I know that for me, strength is a relative concept. I define it as my ability to keep myself alive despite my desire for death. But I don't.